So, thank you so okay. much, Xavi, for, for agreeing to give the talk. I forgot to say no, that in the beginning. It's my pleasure and uh, thanks a lot for the invite. I, yeah, I will try to well, tell you a bit what we are trying to do at, at Codex and I hope well, you, you feel motivated or more motivated towards learning particles afterwards. So yeah, let me start first introducing um, lonely particles and, and explain why, why they are important, right? And why, why they are one of the hot topics at the moment, as Maria said. So, well, I, I've been trying to be a bit um, pedagogical all along the, the talk. So some, some of the stuff I'm gonna say is probably well known for most of you, but still I will, I will say it just, just in case there are some who are not familiar with these kind of things. So you got here a picture in the left hand side of a standard LHC collision. So this is a picture that I took from, from LHCB. I know you all, well, many of you work at CMS, but I decided on, somehow on purpose to, to go for LHCB because this is an event display that is not so common, but it's pretty much the same idea, right? You've got a proton-proton collision in this case here, and then you've, you've got plenty of particles produced over there, and then you reconstruct with, with your detector. And then the thing is that, well, you've got plenty of searches at the LHC, and Usually what you look for is a stuff that is heavy and is produced over there. Um, they came promptly somehow at the PP collision. So this has been the main strategy in the last 10 years or so, but this is not successful, unfortunately. So this is why we have to think about other things. So actually if you do some zoom, and this is what um, this picture in the right hand side is, this is just a zoom of this area here. You see that not all the particles actually are um, produced promptly. Uh, in some cases you've got some particles that fly for a few millimeters and they decay to something else. Um, so this blue th thing here would be what we call a long lived particle. So it's something that again is uh, since you know particles here go at the speed of light more or less uh, even a few uh, um, picoseconds are enough for having some displacement and then you've got things that decay displaced. So this is a lonely particle and, and this is, this well, somehow opens uh, a window to new, to new things, to new kind of phenomena. And I will, this is what I'm describing in this talk essentially. So just, just before continuing, uh, let me also clarify that you've got the option to, to reconstruct some of these um, lonely particles or particles that are even stable uh, to the missing energy. So the idea is that when you have a collision, you've got, you, can re, you can really reconstruct most of the, of the stuff, for instance, in CMS, because it's, it has a full coverage of, of, the, of the collision. And then you, you, know, you miss, if you miss part, part of, the, of the event, so if you sum all, all, all of the energy of the event, all, all, the, all the transverse energy of the event, and you miss part of it, that means that there's something that, that went missing, and you can really indirectly reconstruct this missing particle or this missing piece over there. And this is what we call missing energy, and this is what, what it's done, for instance, to look for dark matter at the LHC. But the thing is that by doing this kind of, of accounting, you, you have a, a resolution that is not great, right? Because well, you have to sum things and, and it could happen there are things that uh, you are missing. And uh, so at the end, you, 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 are, you can try to look for things there, but they have, they have to be heavy. If they are light, it's very hard. So this is important for, for what I'm going to say later. So you've got plenty of LLPs in the standard model. So we know LLPs exist. I mean, they are not just something theoretical a priori. We know they exist and we detect them. So this is a nice picture um, that was done to illustrate what I'm saying. So um, I will show these kind of plots a lot during my talk. So in the, in the Y axis, you've got the lifetime of the particles. In this case, it expressed as C tau. So lifetime time is the speed of light. So this is somehow to, to get a hint of how much the particles fly in, in meters in this case. And then you've got the mass, right? As you can see, there seems to be some sort of anti-correlation between both. So the heavier the particle, the lower the lifetime more or less, but still you've got stuff that is you know, moderately heavy, such as protons that are stable actually, or, or neutrons that are not stable, but they are pretty long leaf. Um, so the thing is that, well, the reasons that produce this kind of particles in the standard model may motivate having the same in BSM, in BSM models, in models beyond the standard model. So um, here, I'm not gonna go into details, uh, but this is just to show that lonely particles are really well motivated in plenty of BSM models. So the reasons, as I was saying, are the same. So you can have either feeble coupling. So if, if you have something that is weakly coupled, 
then it will it will be harder for it to decay so it will you know live uh, a bit longer before decaying and so become lonely part in particle so a similar thing happens when you have another definite mass scale so in all of these models that cover you know, very different types of theories you, you can have um lonely particles and this is what i what i'm what i'm trying to just to to show with this with this slide then um these models uh, give rise to different types of non particles. So uh, this was a very nice um, um, physiology of non particles uh, cartoon that was prepared in this case based on atoms, but this is essentially uh, good for any other detector. So the idea is that you can have either, for instance, a neutral non particle that flies a bit and decays to, to, to other particles. And this is what I showed in the first slide, for instance. Then you can have something that is charged and is more or less stable and that goes uh, through all your detector uh, so this is this is what it's shown here that you can have something that is quite original that is called emerging jets so these are jets that happen not from from standard model particles but from um, hidden particles so you see a jet that, that doesn't come from the primary vertex but rather emerges in the middle of the detector so you've got plenty of different things and depending on, on, on what you want to do, you have to you have to, to look for different stuff in your detector. But I mean, there are there are, there are different options uh, depending on the on the type of, of model or in the, in the type of lonely particle you want to look at. So yeah, the idea is that since this is a hot topic and since this is so important and since also problem searches are not successful, there has really in the last year been a sort of a boom uh, within the legacy detectors to look. To, look, to find for uh, to find BSM physics through lonely particles, right? Uh, I really like this plot. So this is an, an example showing a lonely particle, a uh, search for lonely particles decay into jets. Um, and this is just to show that uh, CMS atoms and LHCD cover somehow different regions of the parameter space. This is again the mass and the lifetime of, of the lonely particle. And well, in this specific search, and this is well, this is this is actually um, motivated by the by the different differences in the triggers. Uh, other, th other three experiments. So CMS can do a priori um, high masses and short lifetimes. Atlas can do um, lower masses and but needs to to ask for uh, longer lifetimes. And then LHB can do low lifetimes and low and low masses. And um, there has even been a community work around these searches at the LHC. Um, and actually, well, there's a workshop going on this week uh, by, by this community. And um, well, we also produce a, a very nice summary uh, report that you can find in this in this um, in this link. Here. Actually, I don't know if, the, if I, I forgot to ask. Well, I, if if the slides can be made public afterwards, because well, this is most of the things are clickable links, so so you can find things afterwards. But anyway, the thing is that um, all of this LHC sensitivity um, works in the limit uh, in which the particles are not light and really long-lived um, because when that happens then essentially the lonely particle flies too much and, and the case outside your the volume of the detector um, the number I, I give here is well it's indicative it's 10 to minus 7 uh, seconds but in general that, that's what it is right i mean you can imagine that if if a particle is really really long-lived it won't it will fly away from the detector and then it will be missed so it, it may it may it may be well happening at the moment that you've got plenty of um, this type of lonely particle being produced at the LHC and you miss them essentially because the detector is not large enough. Um, so this is this shows a bit the landscape, right? Uh, the full landscape. Again, mass versus lifetime. Uh, if you got things that are um, um, light and, and short-lived, well, moderately short-lived, um, LHCB is good. Then, if you have higher masses, um, you have got Atlas and CMS. If you've got things that are really on lift but are heavy at the same time, in principle, you can detect them with Atlas and CMS too, because you've got these missing energy searches. But there's a gap. If you've got things that are light and, and long lift, um, they won't be detected by any of the, of the existing detectors. So, because of this, there has been an explosion of ideas in the last years. So what you want to do is you want to build a new detector that profits from the LHC collisions to detect these sort of elusive lonely particles that the current detectors are not finding. Ideally, ideally you would want you would because this this kind of you assume these kind of things are going to be rare. And they're going to be produced uh, rarely. So you want to have you want something that has no background essentially, 
to have a coverage as large as possible and to be cheap, right? Because if you have to build new coverage and things like that, then the price goes, goes uh, explodes and this is not what you want to do. So there has been a plethora, a plethora of proposals and I'm going to introduce them. Uh, so Codex is missing here because I will go into many more details for Codex afterwards. Um, so the first one I'm, I'm presenting is, is called FACER, which stands for a forward search experiment. Um, and it's a new lonely particle experiment that uses an old LEP injector tunnel. So the idea is that you've got Atlas and then you've got, this is the LHC. And so if you look, there's an auxiliary tunnel over there and this is where FACER wants to be, wants to be installed. So this is actually out of the proposals I'm presenting today is the most advanced one because the phase one of phase was approved last year and it's already it's an actual picture uh, that, I, that I saw this week so they're starting to install things uh, part of the detector already in this cavern here so this is a picture from this week I think and the idea of of, um, of phase is start taking data right away uh, so from well, from the round three of the LHC so in when I wrote 2021 it's most likely 2022 now but they will take data and they want to then move on and, and do more things in RAM4 with an updated, uh, updated detector. So in this case, I'm not going to go into the details of the detector, just, just to, sh to give you a bit an idea of the concept. Um, there's also this idea of, of building phaser new, which would be an extension to detect actually neutrinos from the LHC. So this would be the first time that neutrinos from a collider are found. And there's also this nice idea to build a forward physics facility for the LHC. So Using, um, I think it's this cavern or, or, or a similar cavern, you want to build more, more detectors to profit from the things that are produced forward and are on lift. So, for instance, more neutrinos, for example. And there are these uh, SND or Formosa concepts and that I won't cover today, but uh, you, can, you can look them up if you have curiosity. The next detector that you may have heard of is Mathusla. So, the idea with Mathusla is. Uh, building in the surface above CMS or Atlas a really, really large um, surface detection. So this would be 100 meters by 100 meters and then a decay volume of 25 meters. So this is really a, a very large thing. So the bad thing, the, the main drawback is that it's very expensive because of that. And then, but then you have a lot of sensitivity in the sense that you've got something that, you know, covers a lot of surface and it profits from all the, the collisions at Atlas and, and CMS. And they, they have a letter of intent ready, and I think they want to produce a TTR at some point soon. Anubis um, is a proposal to instrument the service shaft of Atlas. So this is, for those who are familiar with, with um, the LHC detector, usually you have a shaft that is used to move stuff from the surface to the, to the caverns. Uh, and the idea that they want to instrument that shaft uh, with some, well, simple detector somehow to find uh, to look for lonely particles so there are some similarities that you will see later with codex um, so for instance the the this detector will be pretty much integrated with atlas in our case we will uh, codex will be integrated with hcp the cost is moderate because you, you profit from something that is already there um, and then even the detection technology it's it's going to be similar as well uh, one additional nice thing about Anubis is that you can really transfer it to, to CMS if you want, because really it's a matter of you know, just moving the whole thing to another shaft, but it would also work there. Alex is uh, an aggressive idea uh, that would essentially use the, the space currently occupied by Alice. So you've got the, the Alice cavern and in principle Alice is supposed to, to, go, to go out in run five, so in 10, 10 years from now. So this idea would use some of the of the detector capacities of Alice and, and some of the magnets, I think, and reuse the stuff to look for only particles over there. Uh, this is, I think, the last progress idea out of out of all of this, in the sense that I think it was just there was just a paper at the beginning just um, proposing the idea, but no more work has been done here. So I don't know if this is going to progress or not, but the idea is quite aggressive actually. Then something slightly different is millican. Uh, so in this case, you want to look for a specific type of lonely particle that is millicharge. What do you what do I mean with millicharge? I mean that um, the, char the electrical charge of these particles is uh, is fractional, so it's below one, and it, has, it can be as low as you know maybe um, the Vermeer level compared to the to the electron. 
So this is what this plot is showing. You've got the charge of the of the particles and then the mass, and then you see that if you if you go to this kind of of um, masses above one GB, um, there's there are, well, there's a region there that the current experiments like CMS or Atlas cannot cover, and this is why this new pro this new experiment uh, aims at, at at excluding or at finding. Um, so in this case, you also use would use a cavern that is close to CMS in this case. And use scintillators to detect this type of particles, which are very obviously they, they really interact very weakly because they, they hardly have any electrical charge, so they are hard to find. And the nice thing about this Milligan experiment is that they already built a, a demonstrator detector in 2017, and they even published a physics paper with with a search. And this demonstrator covers only one percent of the full detector, um, but it's useful to to understand the feature sensitivity. And the last one I want to present is MAP, which stands for Apparatus for Penetrating Particles. So the idea with MAP, it's, it's an extension of, somehow of, of MODEL. MODEL, it's an experiment that is taking data at the moment. So it's around, the, it's very close to LHCB. It's surrounding the vertex locator of LHCB and looks for monopoles. Um, so in this case, you've got a collaboration that is already working and, and well established. And what you want to do is they want to um, build Close to HCV as well, an additional detector that would look for both newly charged particles, and this is what I just presented, and non leaf particles. And they want to do it in two phases. This MAP1 phase uh, is, has already been approved, and it's, I think it's being built at the moment. And then they want to they upgrade it to something more sensitive that would be MAP2. But this is still to be seen. And also, um, I'm finishing with this first part. Beyond the LHC, there's also this idea of uh, physics beyond colliders. And this is just to profit from the full semi accelerator complex, not only the LHC. So for instance, you have things like SPS, which has lower energy, but has really very high intensity. So that provides a lot of statistics for many things. So the idea with this physics beyond collider is that you, you try to compare the sensitivity of the LHC uh, to, to this kind of idea of complementary experiments. So a very famous example is SHIP that relies on the SPS. And the idea would be building a new uh, beam dump facility in SHIP and search for hidden particles. So you would have something like this. This would have uh, the, the proton from, from the SPS dumped here. Then you would have some vacuum, and then you would have a detector afterwards. And this also provides sensitivity to non-leaf particles. The bad thing about, about SHIP is that this beam dump facility is really, really expensive. So at the moment, it seems because of the European strategy that this is not going ahead, but there's nothing official yet. Okay, so now let me move to the main topic of my talk, to the Codex B detector. So Codex stands for a compact detector for this at LHCV. So this is the LHCV cover. And one nice thing about LHCV is that it's, it's large, but it's not as large as Atlas or CMS. So there's plenty of, of free space in the cover. So at the moment, um, LHCV is here, and you've got a wall, a concrete wall over there, and behind this wall, you've got two things. One is uh, the DAQ system, and then the other is Delphi. Delphi is an old lab experiment, uh, which is there for exhibition program purposes only. So at the moment, uh, LHCV is being upgraded, uh, and one of the, of the things with this upgrade is that the, this DAQ is going to go to the surface. So that leaves plenty of space available. So you see where I'm going, right? So you can use that space to build uh, a new detector over there. And this is, this, this is good in the sense that you, you have no civil work to do. This is just uh, profiting from a space that is there. Um, so the idea is here, you could have a collision happening uh, at LHCB here, and then this would be the non-leaf particle that would decay behind this concrete wall. And you would install your detector over there. So this is, this is what Codex B, it's, it, it's, it's all about. So we wrote an expression of interest uh, last year. So, and we have now a collaboration that is slowly growing and becoming more and more active. Um, so just before going into the details of the, of, the, of the detector, let me go back to this complementarity between different experiments. So again, this is the same plot I've been showing you several times. So you've got the mass of the lonely particle and the lifetime. Uh, so the LHC a priori covers things that are heavy and, and have like, from moderate to, to, to long li lifetimes. Then you've got things that are at the same time light and, and with a moderate um, lifetime, and this is um, 
more for forward vectors such as phaser. And then since codex is transverse, because as you see here, um, this is the this is the LHC direction. So the proton happens here. So this is very transverse with respect to the direction. So that means that you are sensitive to to um, longer lifetimes and also well, longer and so harder processes somehow. So the three the, the, all the experiments are, are complementary from that point of view. So codex V would be more competitive with uh, Methuselah, for instance, or Anubi that is not in this plot, but has, it's more or less um, in the same direction. So the detector is simple in the sense that you want to do something that is cheap. So we're going to have something that is uh, at or below 10 million euros, more or less. So it, uh, Codex B is just a cube, a 10 by 10 by 10 meter um, meters cube, which covers 1% uh, of the angular acceptance overall. So the idea is using resistive plate chambers, which are um, pretty fast and precise detectors. I will I will explain what resistive plate chambers are in just a second. But the idea is that you could have in each of the six phases uh, five um, layers of of, um, of RPCs. Sorry, sorry, six layers of RPCs, and you could have five additional layers inside of the detector. With this, you could improve the virtual resolution and tracking efficiency. Uh, as I said before, since Delf is there. If the LFI were to be removed, and this is something that could happen um, if we really push enough, and then you would have access to a, even a larger box because you would have more, more available space. One nice thing about this RPC is that, is, that, is that you can do timing with them, and with that, you can really get an idea of the mass of the knowledge particle, which is very nice. So, the idea with these RPCs is using the technology and expertise for, for, from the Atlas MIUM upgrade. Uh, so, we are collaborating with them. And as I promised, let me just briefly say what is an RPC. So this is an idea that was developed in the in the 80s from uh, Santonico and Cardarelli. So essentially, what you have is just two um, plates uh, that are separated by around one millimeter or so, and you've got gas in between, and you have high voltage applied between both plates, and this creates some an electrical field. So when a when a charged particle goes through this detector, it ionizes the gas and it creates an electron avalanche that then reaches um, the plates and and provides analytical charts that, that you use to detect. Uh, so the idea is simple, but it's, as I said before, really, really precise and fast and, and effective. So then the main challenge is that you want to, since we are using or we plan to use this Atlas RPC, um, RPCs, you want you need to adapt them to the to the LHCB without in the sense that we want to use, uh, even if Codex B is an independent um, collaboration, uh, effectively it will, it, it will act as if it was a, a subdetector of LHCB because this is convenient for the readout and makes our life much easier. So we're going to make sure that, you know, the RPC boards can really talk to the LHCB boards, uh, which is, which is, which we check to be the case. And, uh, and then um, you need to adapt also mechanically um, the RPCs to, to, the, to this new structure, to the new copic structure. And this is, this is work ongoing. And there's also the idea to extend the detector to do more things like calorimetry, uh, and this I will discuss later very briefly. One more thing you need um, is shielding in the sense that, okay, you still have this, this concrete wall that is two, three meters wide, and this is very nice, but it's not enough because well, at the LHC you've got so many particles produced that you need more things to, to protect um, um, your, your, the Codex B detector from, from backgrounds, right? So for this, we will need an, an active veto uh, and the idea is that this, with this um, active veto, you can also, apart from actively vetoing stuff, you can really put some additional material there, like uh, lead, for example. Uh, and with this, you get an, you know enough shielding to to have almost a zero background um, a zero background um, detector. Uh, but well, this is still so. This was the, we have some estimations. I'm not gonna, I'm not going to go into the numbers exactly here. We've got some estimations uh, using JAM. And the idea is that we expect the, the rate to be below one hertz, which is very nice. So we can really be a trigger rest detector. So you, you just record everything that arrives. So this is a call calendar of the of the of the of Codex B. So at the moment we are here in 2021, and the run fee of the late C is expected to to start in 2022. So so towards the end of the of the round three. More or less in in 2025, uh, we would we will start producing Codex B, and then uh, hoping to take data in the round for, for for these three years and and also uh, further in the future. 
Okay, so I've been talking for 27 minutes now. So before continuing with the physics, let me do a sort of intermezzo, if you allow me, um, just to tell you in two minutes um, why codex, codices are important in, in Santiago or for, uh, for us in Santiago. Um, because if you look at, if you look at uh, my introductory slide, um, I show this, this was my background, right? And this is what it's called the Codex, Codex Calistinus. And this is quite an important uh, historical text. And this is a compilation of texts um, providing uh, well, background and details regarding the way of St. James, the Camino de Santiago, including uh, sermons, reports of miracle, of miracle survey, liturgical texts. And it's really old, it's from the, so, uh, 138, 145, and it has been in the Cathedral of Santiago since then. Well, actually, not all the time, because we had this thing that in 2011, it was gone, and it was really a tragedy uh, for us in Santiago. So it was gone for almost a year. It was stolen by this guy. And this guy was a former employee of the cathedral, and he was really pissed off with the, with the cathedral because they, they had a lot of debts with him. So as a retaliation, he just stole the thing for one year and he kept it in his garage. Uh, and he was convicted because of that and also because he had stolen, well, uh, more than two million euros from collection boxes. Uh, so, okay, um, let me now just go back to the physics. This was just because I, I was risking to probably lose, uh, lose many of you at this point. So maybe with this short story, I managed to recover some of you back. And let me go back to the physics case of Codex B now. So the idea is that uh, before before that, just to introduce this uh, this um, concept of dark sector, right? So you've got different paradigms to address the standard model problems. You've got the well-known Wien paradigm where you have the standard model plus other things that are under the same theoretical framework somehow. And then you've got this other dark sector idea where you have like the standard model that is somehow disconnected from this from this other sector, and you've got portals uh, that connect both things. So this is um, this connection is usually through loops. So then that means that it's weak. So that means that you, ha you have many times not only particles as, as a signature in these kind of cases. And this is why this is interesting for us at Codex B. So this, these portals can be of different type. You've got the Higgs, Vector, Neutrino, and Action Portal. And the nice thing is that Codex is actually sensitive, sensitive to all of them. So in our expression of interest document, we recovered um, all of these portals, we have a plethora of studies um, assuming different production and, and decay types. And just to show you a few examples in the next slides. So for instance, if you look at dark photons, which are pretty well known at the moment. Uh, so this covers different um, masses of the light photon, can be 0.5 GV or 10 GV. And these are different um, uh, lifetime. So you got, you, this is the sensitivity that you've got for a branching ratio of the Higgs decaying to, to dark photons. So for instance, if you look at something that is very light, you see that uh, Atlas and, and, and Codex cover different lifetimes. Then also Methuselah in this case could be more sensitive. And then if you look at heavier, um, heavier uh, dark photons, the idea is pretty much the same. You've got, um, you cover different, different regions from Atlas and, and Codex. For the Higgs portal, um, Higgs portal may affect or may provide two different types of signatures. If you have the Higgs on shell, you will have a Higgs decaying to, to scalars that are long lived, but it, it can also interfere in emission decay. So you would have something like a emission decaying to, um, to long lived particles that appear through a Higgs appearing uh, off shell. And obviously, well, the long lived particle in both cases is different. In this case, obviously, it's going to be much harder in BT, for example. So that acceptance, lifetime, et cetera, at the end that you observe in the laboratory is different. And again, um, with codex, you achieve, uh, you reach regions that you cannot reach at all with the current um, LHC detectors. And then well, it's complementary to ship, for instance, Spacer or, or, or Methuselah. Heavy neutral leptons. In this case, you've got uh, neutrinos that are uh, coupled to electrons, muons, or taus. And once again, I'm not going into details, uh, but you cover different um, regions of the parameter space. And most, most importantly, uh, you reach regions that cannot be reached by the current experiments. And this is the overall idea of, of this experiment. I promised before that I would cover this calorimetry possibility. So the idea with calorimetry is that 
well, you can do things that you cannot do without without it. Obviously, one is uh, particular identification uh, because you can directly measure the energy, and then with this you can really distinguish, for instance, neutrals from hadrons and photons. And also, you can also improve the characterization of highly boosted LLPs because if, if in that case, you know, the tracks that uh, your lonely particle produces are really close to each other, so you are not able to distinguish them. But with the calorimeter, you can really measure the energy, um, even if it's combined in one single calorimeter cell, for example. And in this plot, this is the fourth of the portals I mentioned before, the ALP portal. And in this case, um, the red lines correspond to what you have with no calorimetry, and then the the purple region is what you have with calorimetry. So as you can see, it would be better. So this is something we need to study in detail. Uh, for for now, there are only very preliminary studies to see if this is this would be, this would be worth it or not. Because at the end of the day, calorimetry would be would mean more money. So you really have to motivate if it's a good idea to have it or not. Last part of the of the physics reach. This is not related to the portals anymore, but it's something that is very important as well. This is our dark matter models. Just two examples of types of dark matter models, co-scattering and co-annihilation, where once again, uh, you would have an, um, an, a signature that would involve lonely particles and you would be able to find it with codex um, and also with other experiments such as Mathuslaw or Phaser. But still, uh, what I'm trying to show with all of this is that codex is really sensitive to a plethora of models uh, and it would really be able to to well to um, look for things that other experiments cannot look for at the moment so last part of my talk is going to be related to codex beta and you will see what i mean with codex beta in a moment so the idea is that uh, as i showed before codex beta is going to be a high luminosity detector so in five years from now more or less and the, reason, the main reason for this is that it requires a lot of statistics to provide sensitivity because these processes are in general very rare, so you need a lot of collisions to find them. Uh, so before before then, we really well have some ideas in mind to things we can do in, in the meantime. One is really measuring in detail the actual background that you have in that region of the late CV cavern. So this was done, uh, um, I think, two years ago. Well, the measurements were taken two years ago, and, and the analysis came last year, I think. And the idea is that you have uh, in this region of the of the cavern, we put some scintillators and we measure what we what we got from the from the collisions. Um, this is exactly the same region where we plan to install codex afterwards. Uh, so we measure in different points, cover, well, yeah, corresponding to these different um, regions here, to these different numbers and with different angles with respect to the beam line. And what we found is a, a heat rate that it's uh, 0.2 hertz, that is really below what you predict with the end, that is 10 hertz. So this is good in the sense that um, it means that we're, we're really conservative when doing the, the prospects for the, for the physics reach. The, if, if the background is really a factor of 10 smaller, that means that your reach is going to be larger, which is really good and goes, and goes in, the, in the right direction. And uh, in order to understand this difference, we did um, Another, another we, we did another simulation with Fluca instead of Giant, and what we found is compatible with Giant in principle. So there's something we need to understand there. So apparently we measure less background than, than, than what we predict with the simulation, and we need to understand why. But in any case, the sensitivity that I presented so far is all based in this conservative assumption. So if if, if this measurement is true, this will go in a good direction. And um, well, beyond this, this modest um, measurements with with um, with the scintillators, we want to do something a bit more more um, complex. And this is building a demonstrator detector. This is what Codex Beta stands for. So with this, you would be able to test the technology, um, the reconstruction, and also the integration with the LHCb readout or, or data acquisition. Then measure these backgrounds more accurately, and with this, define the physics case more accurately. So Codex Beta is going to be a smaller version of Codex B. So instead of um, 10 meters by 10 meters by 10 meters, it's going to be uh, 2 meters by 2 meters by 2 meters. And it will have less. Uh, so it's going to be based on RPCs as well, but with less um, amount of, of layers. So you, would, you will have the six faces as well, but you would have only one internal layer in, in the middle. We have already the space in the cavern for, for, for that. So this is really something that will happen very, very soon. 
in this case, we have no, we will, we will have no active veto. So this limits also the physics reach of this correct beta detector. Uh, we spent a lot, of, a lot of scale on the case, but this is going to be useful, for instance, to test the reconstruction algorithms. Then the, as I said before, for codex for codex B, the idea is that um, you will send uh, will send data uh, to the to the same kind of readout board at the rate of LHCB, and this we think is going to work, and we will need to provide obviously the, the that data formats and integration to the for LHCB for reconstruction and, and, and simulation. Obviously, this needs funding. This is much cheaper than Codex B, but it still requires some funding. But we are, we think we have enough funding to build this. So I'm really optimistic that it will be, this will be built. As an example, this, this, in these plots, I show you the technical drawings for the mechanical structure, which are, um, this is work ongoing, but well, there's some progress already there. Concerning the physics reach, well, it's poor because, as I said before, uh, First of all, you have less statistics than what you expect for the high lumi LHC. And second, and second of all, is that well, you have no active veto, so you will have more background. But still, if you have, in some cases, like multi-body decays of LLPs, you might still just be able to do something. And this is what this plot shows, that graphs and sensitivity, uh, for, for instance, for the case of uh, only particle decays to four tracks. And then this is an updated calendar where I show Codex B, apart, uh, not only Codex B, Codex Beta, not only Codex B, sorry. And the idea will be by producing the first modules like in a few months from now, uh, installing uh, the detector towards the beginning of round three and, and taking data uh, during round three, just to with all these goals that I, I mentioned a moment ago. And after that, then we will move immediately to, to the full Codex B detector. So let me move now to the conclusions. Uh, so first of all, let me bring back this uh, European strategy document because one of the main um, recommendations in the European strategy, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but the idea is that um, you wanna do things like searches for actions, dark sector candidates and field interacting particles. This is lonely particles. And for this, the European strategy document recommends a diverse program that is complementary to the energy frontier. Uh, and this, this is um, recognized as an essential part of the European particle physics strategy. So I think this really endorses what we are trying to do here. So take home messages. Um, LLPs, I think it's very clear at the moment that they might be the key for finding BSM physics. And there's a plethora of efforts um, that has bigger that has been triggered around the LHC and beyond. Uh, I have shown several examples um, that Codex B has great sensitivity and it has the advanced advantage that is very important that is a chip detector. It doesn't require any big uh, works. It's just you know gas detectors and pretty much that's it. We have done some good progress and we have our EOI ready. Um, so the collaboration, let me say that it was, it was born around LHCB, but now it has expanded beyond. So we have collaborators from Atlas, CMS, uh, Theory. The first important step towards Codex B is gonna be this Codex Beta demonstrator. Uh, and in the future, we might be able to do more studies to increase the sensitivity, such as for instance, having a carimetry. So as Maria said before, we have now a new formal structure that was born like one month ago, where uh, Phil Hilton from Cincinnati is the spokesperson and I'm myself the physics coordinator. And I, I, since then we have really contacted a lot of people and, and we are gaining some momentum at the moment, I think. So the collaboration is growing a lot. We have new people from all across the, the LHC experiments and we look forward to new collaborators. So let me know if you're interested. And now I'm happy to answer anything you have. Uh, thank you so much, Xavi, uh, for a really very good uh, uh, seminar, and I think this is a very interesting experiment. I think we're going to start, as usual, with questions, so just raise your hand if you, have, if you want to speak. Or while they think the questions, let, let me start. So I have a question on the APCs. Can you go back to, to that part? The APCs and the connection to the to the LHCB boards, basically. So it's a question with two parts. The first part is that this is based on the Atlas upgrade. Is this like um, too 
to benefit from just to use the same the same cards and maybe produce them at the same time uh, are they produced and you would use uh, something that already exists or you would need to, to produce them uh, this i haven't understood completely so the idea is that um, they are part of the collaboration so they, they will produce them for us somehow so we will provide the money and we will help them so we will provide some person power but i think they will they will just for the I think that they have this first um, uh, BIS 78 uh, module and, and they they want to just review it redo it for us so they are part of the collaboration and they, they will they will essentially do it with our help um, so that's that's the idea and yeah I mean the, the main reason to use to use it is that it's something that it's already well um, well established so we don't want to reinvent the wheel right and if what they have works, it's better for us just to reuse it. And actually, I think for Anubis, they are doing the same. So the idea for Anubis is also reusing the, this uh, RPCs from the Atlas Mion upgrade. Okay. And do you know why Atlas? And it is just because of the Atlas groups are the ones that are involved in this and, and the CMS one, because we also have RPCs in CMS. So this is just a, a question if you know why. It, it's just uh, it's probably a structural due to the groups, no? Yes, I think it's something like that. I, I think this is, this is it was decided or it was before I got involved. Uh, so this was, this was from the very beginning, I guess, because of some of the initial proponents uh, knew the Atlas Mion guys or something like that. I'm not sure, to be honest. Okay, and, and then uh, also related to this, you said that the, the RPCs need to connect to the LC, uh, LACB boards. Uh, mm -hmm. this, so that I understand, would the data taking be synchronous? So you would take the same event. So the, would you be able to correlate the, the events in Codex B and, and LHCV and exploit, I guess, the LHCV information as well? Or? Yeah, okay. this is a very good point that I forgot to mention. Yeah, no, you would be able to do it to do it together. So you would have events that would have it would be yeah it would be synchronous. So you could be able to, for instance, look for a stuff that is produced at the same time at Codex and Codex and and LHCB. So one of the things we are, one of the things I'm doing with a PhD student is trying to study the possibility to look at, for instance, things like associated heat Higgs production. So you would have, uh, if it's uh, BVF, you would have the jet in LHCB and then you would have the LLP at Codex, for example, and things like that. So yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. So that is interesting to do. Yeah. Uh, Isabel? Uh, hello, Xavier. Thank you very much for the, for the seminar. Uh, a bit related with this. So this is an independent effort, but at the end, you are very much dependent on LHCB. So if I join you that I am CMS, uh, but then at the end, uh, I depend on, yeah. So um, this is not so independent effort. <laughs> uh, although you are uh, inviting people um, from many uh, no matter where, uh, so how do you want to, how do you plan to, to handle this? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a good question. I mean, um, we have to be independent collaboration because we have people from others from the very beginning because they are, help, as I said, they are building part of, the, of our detector. So this is clear. And we will have to pay as an independent collaboration uh, to use some of the LHCB resources, um, so this is this is this is clear. Then, for for the kind of thing I was saying a moment ago, that you would look at the at things in coincidence between LHCB and, and Codex, I agree that this is a bit a bit more tricky. Uh, that we need to, to see how to do it. But in principle, there's no, I mean, there's no problem at all to to um, to be part of both of, of Codex B and an, an, another collaboration at the same time, because as I said, we have these Atlas people who want to stay in Atlas for sure and are part of Codex. So then for this specific thing of, of measuring, I guess at some point you would need to divide the, the data in, into different um, streams. One would go for LHCB, one would go for Codex. And for this um, integration uh, aspects for, for this, um, measurements where you would use both the detectors at the same time, I guess this would need to, to be studied independently. But in principle, it's going to be, it, it, should be, it should be independent. We depend on LHCB in the sense that if LHCB, for instance, uh, um, upgrade beyond 2030 is not approved, which I don't think is going to be the case. I think it's going to be approved and because this, this is what everyone believes. But if that were to happen, then 
well, obviously, LHC be, uh, Codex B could be in trouble beyond, uh, beyond 2030. But yeah, uh, there's this specific thing of, of, the, of looking for things simultaneously in Codex and, and LHC B that would need to be studied. Otherwise, I think it should, it should work. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is your feeling? Because uh, you, you have presented, uh, there's a, a long list of, of new experiments proposed. Mm -hmm. So do you think that all of them will be approved? Uh, I, think, it, I think so. I think there's some complementarity, as I said. So for instance, Spacer and Codex, they can be both approved at the same time because they cover different things. And as, as I showed in this, well, it's here. Yeah, right? I mean, yeah. But then, so for instance, Alex, I don't think this is gonna go ahead because as I said, there's no work at all being done there. And some of the proponents of, of Alex are in Codex B and they're working in Codex B. So I don't think this is gonna go ahead. Then you've got Mathusla. Mathusla, you know, um, so they're really, you know, noisy, let me say. But the thing is that it's a super expensive detector. It's maybe a lot of money to more expensive than Codex. It's maybe a hundred million euros. So, you know, it's going to depend on what happens in the future. So if we decide to move for FCC, for example, or things like that, then I don't think Mathura is going to happen because, you know, you want to put your money somewhere else. And you can reach, you can have, you know, not maybe as, as a good reach, but you can have a really, really competitive reach with things that are way, way more cheap. Then um, Anubis, it's a bit more delayed compared to Codex, but it's it could happen. But you know, if, if you're talking about experiments that are that price, you can even have some. It's fine to have some competition, I would say. Mm -hmm. So, I'm at this point, it's hard to say. At this point, there's competition, and there's no guarantee that uh, that an experiment is going to be built. Mm -hmm. But I could say that you know, since for instance, concerning Codex, we have Codex Beta almost approved and happening for sure. This is going to push us a lot towards having the full detector. Mm -hmm. um, and then things like uh, Milli kind of things like that, I mean, those cover a different thing because this, this, those are focused in the charged particles. So I think those can happen in parallel to, to Codex, for example. Mm -hmm. And are you planning to, to, to apply for a, some kind of European grant or so? Because this is quite uh, novel. So it's very complementary to the previous searches in Atlas, CMS and LHCV. So Maybe there's a window there. Yeah, that's something we have, we have to explore, for sure. I, yeah, I tried in the past a bit, didn't work, but uh, this is something we have to continue exploring. Um, there's this idea of having an ITN with learning particles, for example, uh, and this could go in. I mean, this is, this is work ongoing, I would say. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Thank you. So this, are, this collaboration are intended to be a group of 50 people, 100. Uh, um, how many so, people do you need to, to operate, to construct or to build and operate the, this so in so particular for, codex? So for codex beta, you, you don't need really a lot of people because it's it's something more or less easy. For codex B, you will need more people. Out. And the, the problem with this kind of experiment is that there's no one, almost no one working on this full time. I mean, this, these are always parallel projects. Mm -hmm. So, oh, I mean, maybe you need a hundred people to have 50 or 30 full-time equivalents, you know, so that's the, that's the idea. And then also having people is interesting because then first, because it, it, it you know, you give the image that you're really, I mean, this is a bit crude, crude to say maybe, but you, you have you give the image that you have plenty of people endorsing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah really, no, 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 no. Uh -huh. And then the, the other reason is that you need to, even if you only are there to, to provide some funding, this is really important as well, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Isabella and Xavi. Uh, Nacho? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, I didn't know how to raise my hand, so I, I just unmuted. Uh, so this is a question from a complete outsider of the field, so sorry about, probably you, you, you might have mentioned at the beginning. It's from the physics side of things. Um, are there um, specific predictions for long-lived particles that uh, you're looking for uh, to confirm or uh, otherwise discard? Or is it just, um, or, or are you just exploring unexplored parameter space? So do we have predictions for these particles in, uh, super, from supersymmetry or I don't know uh, what other possibilities um, have arisen to, to 
Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, you do. It, it depends on the, it depends on the on the actual model. Uh, I don't think I have it here, but for instance, yeah, I mean, like, essentially in these types of Higgs portal, so this sine square, this is a mixing between the Higgs and the and the well, and, and the, so this this explores somehow the, the Higgs, the mixing between the Higgs and the, and the dark sectors. So essentially. This is an exclusion plot, right? But if the mixing happens to be like here, this means that it will be found by codex, for example. So, like I said, here what you want to do is you want to exclude this full plane. If you if you exclude that full plane, then essentially you kill this model, or you, maybe then you can go to really small couplings. But I think then you start having issues um, concerning, for instance, cosmological um, cosmological measurements and things like that. But in this kind of models, usually you have a lot of, of free space, uh, of free parameter space um, to, to do searches. But ideally, you want to exclude all of this. I don't know if I, if I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, sure. So this is um, a, a mixing for, of, of the Higgs with uh, uh, a generic particle from the dark sector, let's yeah, say. Yes, uh, yes. Okay, yes. yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks. Yes. Uh, hi, Xavier. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this uh, interesting seminar. So I had a couple of questions. One was related, I, I wanted to, to ask you about Matuspla and the comparison, because indeed you have mentioned that uh, it is much more expensive experiment, but at the same time, uh, in many of the plots you have shown, it has a larger coverage or the, uh, it can uh, limit or restrict or cover uh, wider regions in phase space. Uh, just to have your uh, opinion on whether this is, uh, maybe it, it is expensive, but uh, it is worth uh, uh, doing it because of the phase space that is going to cover. Yeah, I mean, I I agree that in the limit where you have enough money, you want to do something that is as large as possible. I, you could even do Mathusla um, that is two times larger and even have more sensitivity, right? But mm. the thing is that you have to be a bit realistic. Um, and yeah. This is what this is what we are trying to. This is the, our the approach we're trying to follow. That we want to build something that really we know we can afford, and that. But um, yeah, in the limit where you have enough money, I agree that it's, it's better to do something as good as possible. But for instance, as I said before, I don't think FCC and Mathusla. So if you if you ask me, if in the limit where you have enough money, you, you do FCC and Mathusla. That's it. But I don't think this. I think this, that's impossible. So I think it's better to do FCC and Codex B and not Mathusla and no FCC, for example, because you, you also want to put some money to cover the energy frontier. So I, I would say it's better to follow the approach, the approach of having something that is cheaper and is realistic, and then, you know, putting all the money in other, in other projects. Um, but I mean, obviously, this is something that, that you can debate. Eh? I'm sure, sure. that. Uh, no, no, no. And I, another thing which is uh, quite different is what is Santiago implication in this? Of course, it is you who uh, in the end is physics coordinator, so it's a, a very important role in the in the collaboration. But uh, regarding the, the Santiago group, uh, what would be the, the implication? Would there be some uh, hardware? Everything would be physics? Uh, so that's something I'm trying to negotiate. Um, so we at the moment there's this PhD student and myself mainly and there was there was this call for internal projects in Santiago called Ignite so we have when well, I think you have the Maria Maez as well right um, and we have we have it and like part of the money for the Maria Maez it was decided to be to be um, split in a competitive call so we so people from the from the institute we had a chance to apply for money for projects and I applied and I got it I got one for codex so this is I'm we are also supporting uh, codex beta we are building part of the of the of the detector as well um well sorry buying part of the detector as well then for the for the so for the physics this is uh, for physics as you said is myself and this is student and we want to we want to we want to 
work there. Then for the for the hardware, I'm trying to convince some of the people doing. But in Santiago, we're doing silicon at the moment, so no gas. So I'm trying to convince some of the people to help maybe with the with the readout with integration. But this is but this is still under negotiation. So <laughs> I cannot promise more more involvement for the moment. But okay, thanks a lot. Hopefully, the future it will, it will improve. Yeah, thanks and good luck as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Begoña and Xavi. I do have more questions, but it is true that it is 12.30, so I would rather let uh, other people raise their hands if they have something to ask than just... Uh... Okay, so let me ask one last thing. Ah, okay, Begoña wants to follow up. Let, let me ask one, one last thing and then uh... Begoña and, uh, and, and then I think we, we will need to wrap up. Uh, on the calorimetry expansion that you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. this, uh, I, I haven't understood how is the, if you go back to the structure of the detector, so is this something that could be added? Um, Yeah, I know. That needs to uh, go from the beginning, or is this, this something that you could decouple and maybe since you are going to, you were proposing two runs, no, one for uh, run four and one for run five, basically. Is this something that could be an upgrade? If yeah, of uh, course, of course, of course. Yeah, no, no, there's no need to have it at the beginning. Yeah, I think you could start with this simple structure and then start adding more things. I mean, you could even think about adding I don't know, a magnet, for example, and things like that. Okay. So, so uh, that would be nice. Uh, yeah. Okay, Begoña, you had a, a, another question? Well, it was only a simple question uh, that surprised me at the beginning of the talk. I think it was uh, around slide nine. Uh, you had a diagram or a sketch showing the, the different regions in phase space in CETA and in mass covered by the different uh, uh, one before. Yeah, that one, covered by the different experiments. And I was really surprised to see that CMS and ATLAS were covering uh, such different phase spaces and uh, in turn, CMS and LHCB were more similar. And I cannot see very well, the, the one is CITAO, the other one is the mass. So yeah. what is, the, is this uh, assuming, I think you mentioned something related to the trigger. Are yeah. you assuming that one experiment is triggering, let's say, with the calorimet calorimeters and the other one is triggering with the, the tracker or something uh, or neon system so that they are so different? In so this, this is not assumptions in the sense that this is just um, actual results. Um, so this is actual exclusion from, from the three experiments. Although well, this is a bit old, as you see, this is from Yang mm -hmm. Wang. Yes. But uh, yeah, I think the idea here is that, as you say, uh, like here atlas is triggering using the calorimeters only while here cms needs the you know the trackers and then and then the the, the different in mass is just because lhcb can have lower pt thresholds which at the end gives you sensitivity to lower masses but yeah, yeah. This, this plot always uh there's always questions about it when, when sure. we show it yeah because maybe it's because it is oh, <laughs> But yeah, you say this is ATV because uh, in, in fact, if you go to one more slide, uh, this one is uh, telling you a bit different thing. So Atlas and CMS are not, not yeah, but overlapping totally in the same, but uh, more closer to... Yeah, but this is, this is a cartoon I did. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. No, I, 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 I know. Okay. Uh, Maybe this is more realistic and more. Uh... Yeah, no, I think if you cover, if you look at all the possibility, all the possible final states and so on. Yeah, I think at the end it's as you say. I mean, there should be a big overlap between Atlas and CMS. Yes, yeah, so uh, maybe in the in the previous slide. So instead of Atlas and CMS, this is a particular Atlas analysis and a particular CMS analysis, and yes. we could do the opposite. No, so it is. Uh, yes, I, that's what that I understand. Yeah, just because this plot became really popular in the sense that it's good for us in the sense that it, well, even if there's a big overlap between LHCB and CMS here, it's you know it shows that LHCB can cover a bit this gap, so it, it's good for LHCB. It's not it's not so important for Atlas and CMS from that point of view, but yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but as we are CMS, we also look from our no, no, I understand. point I understand. of view. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Shari. I actually have more questions, but I think it is uh, twelve thirty-four. So I uh, think I will just continue discussing with you to, to not monopolize. Uh, just one last moment uh, to give everybody time to ask one last thing. Last call, basically. Well, since there seems to, to not be it. Thank you so much, Shavi. It has been really a, a very interesting uh, seminar. And I think the proposal is, is also, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's a very nice proposal. As I say, I want to discuss with you later, if, if you want. Okay. Nice. Uh, okay. So let me stop the recording and in the...